As a filmmaker, I try to remain a neutral observer. But what caused me to tell Stan Groff's story and what I learned in the process made that impossible. My name is Susan, and for most of my life, I felt like I really didn't belong here. Like I was born on the wrong planet. All I could think of was how to go back. The magic that filled my dreams would evaporate with the daylight. For a while, ballet seemed like the place where I belonged, but even that eventually changed. Then in my early 20s, I tried LSD. For the first time, I felt lovable. Finally, I believed in myself and everything changed. But without a structure to ground me, I made bad choices that harmed my body and others that took years to undo. And then I discovered shamanism and learned how to journey. Up I went, past the clouds, beyond the Earth's atmosphere, until I was surrounded by darkness. I met my teachers and felt that I had known them forever. They healed me, helped me make sense of the world, and could explain anything. Once I even asked for a story, and they showed me one. I started to make changes that were difficult. I traveled to France and fell in love. But then we couldn't get pregnant, and I learned that if I wanted a baby, I'd have to tune back into Earth. When I thought my kids were old enough, I tried to reconnect. There were insights, but no upward journey to meet my teachers. In the search for another way to reconnect with them, I learned about Stan Groff. Consciousness is not something that emerges as an accident after billions of years of evolution, uh, something that requires a central nervous system. And I had an experience that just really changed my life, both professionally and personally. People get, get uh, tranquilizers and get uh, hospitalized for experiences that in other cultures would be considered extremely valuable. Stan Groff is known as a pioneer of psychedelic psychotherapy. Drawing from his own experiences and from thousands of high-dose LSD sessions with his patients. The insights he gained personally, combined with the experiences of his patients, expanded his understanding of the human psyche. It stretched beyond the biographical information that begins after we are born, to memories surrounding our time in the womb and during the birth process. His expanded map even included the spiritual nature of humanity, recognizing past life experiences and dimensions of consciousness we share with all of creation. Stan used these insights to co-found transpersonal psychology with Abraham Maslow and working with his wife, Christina, organized international transpersonal conferences around the world. During much of this period, Stan was also the scholar in residence at the Esalen Institute in Big Sur. Spiritual masters and groundbreaking pioneers representing a broad spectrum of disciplines were frequent guests at the workshops and month-long retreats he offered during his 14 years there. It was there that Stan and Christina developed holotropic breathwork, a breathing technique that could induce powerful non-ordinary states of consciousness similar to an LSD session. I had to meet Stan. On some deep level, I knew he could help me find my way back in. When I learned he would be teaching a course, I signed up immediately. I was so far talking about non-ordinary states of consciousness, 
but I have been all these 60 years now interested in a very significant large subgroup of uh, these non-ordinary experiences uh, for which current uh, psychiatry and psychology has no special name. They're all put in the category of altered states of consciousness. What it suggests somehow is that there's a correct way of experiencing ourselves and the world, and that in these states it's distorted. We have to use this new psychology if we want to use effectively uh, holotropic states. You know, like if we want to run psychedelic sessions or, or do holotropic breathwork, or if we want to work with people who are in spiritual emergency. I had read about Stan's theories on how our experiences in the womb affected our unconscious, but to hear him explain it gave me a you whole new understanding. Find the, uh, the, the experiences, if you regress to, to uh, birth, the experiences come in four patterns. I call them perinatal matrices, basic perinatal matrices. The first perinatal matrix relates to the situation of the fetus still in the womb before the onset of the delivery. This could be pregnancy, which is a result of planning of the parents, a loving expectation. The mother is physically healthy, is in emotionally good condition. Reliving of that kind of state could be a very ecstatic experience. Now, this doesn't necessarily happen. There are pregnancy, which are a result of rape, of a one-night stand when both parents were drunk, where the marriage was broken, the mother is abused, physically and emotionally unhealthy. The pregnancy could be so unwelcome that there are attempts at abortion. Another possibility, the mother is RH negative, the father is RH positive, so that from the beginning, the fetus is being attacked, immunologically treated as an invader. Come nine months plus minus, this is the onset of the delivery. First hormonal changes, which are then translated into mechanical contractions of the uterus. Each contraction compresses the arteries and interrupts placentary circulation between the mother and the child which means no supply of oxygen, no nourishment coming in, and there's no removal of a metabolic product. There's no resolution for it because the cervix is not open, just contractions of the uterus in a closed system. Now with each contraction, the cervix is being pulled over the head, it's dilating. When it reaches the necessary size, then it's the transition to the third matrix, the contractions continue with all the consequences, but the cervix is now open, so there is this laborious propulsion through the breast canal. Now there are tremendous pressures here. Suffocation and the pain generate powerful energy, which has all the qualities of sexual energy. Our first encounter with sexual energy, we were inflicting pain on another organism. Another organism was inflicting pain on us we couldn't breathe, there were a lot of pressures and fear. This kind of experience then can become the basis of the development of various sexual dysfunctions, deviations, aberrations, perversions. And then we have the completion of the delivery head first or feet first, and then the umbilical cord is cut. From then on, the child exists as an anatomically independent individual, still biologically, emotionally dependent, of course. The matrices begin with unity. Transition to hell with no escape. Then to purgatory, with the end in sight, where you are the victim and the perpetrator and the observer, and finally culminate in freedom and a newfound sense of connection. As Dan finished, I remembered the rebirthing workshop I'd taken at Rajneesh Puram back in the 80s. I felt like I was dropping into a deep pit that grew more painful as I descended. Just when I thought I was going to die, I burst through into an ocean of love and light.
Joseph Campbell is best known for his work in comparing mythologies and religions from cultures around the world. He met Stan in the late 60s at a conference in New York City. When Campbell heard Stan's theory on the four perinatal matrices, he instantly solved a mystery that had intrigued him for years. He couldn't understand how cultures from diverse geographical locations could share the same death-rebirth themes. He called it a monomyth. But when he saw Stan's presentation, he understood that these cultures were reliving the experience of their own births. The perinatal matrices, especially the third moving into the fourth, served as the threshold for the hero's journey. The rites of passage that these cultures developed allowed their initiates to access unconscious birth memories, face their fear of death, and finally, free themselves from a deep maternal dependency. Birth itself is not only a rite of passage, but is perhaps the universal rite of passage that we all go through. Perhaps it's through that experience that we come into the world uh, knowing deeply that if we are to succeed in the ongoing actualization of our potentials, whatever they are as individuals, throughout the life cycle for however long we live, we will need to undergo repeatedly similar rites of passage. Holotropic breathwork is an experiential approach to self-exploration, to therapy, which uses very, very simple means. It, it uses faster breathing, it uses powerful evocative music, and also a certain kind of bodywork when it's indicated. So each individual will choose a partner. One of those people does the breathing, and the other person sits with him or her, and then they switch roles so that everybody gets a chance to participate both as a breather and as a, what we call a sitter. And we also combine it with what we call mandala drawings. And after the session, they try to communicate what happened to them in a kind of graphic way. The second day of the conference was the breathwork. I couldn't believe how anxious I felt. Towards the end of the three hours, I sat up, thinking that it was over. It had been a pleasant experience, and I tried to tell the facilitator that I was fine, that she could take care of the next person. But she wouldn't leave. The minutes stretched on, when suddenly, a wave of sadness rolled up from my belly. And that's when I understood the meaning of Stan's phrase, as long as it takes, everyone deserves the time for the process to fully unfold. Later during the course, Stan showed slides from his Tantra presentation. It was the same theme that my teacher showed me some 20 years earlier. Suddenly I realized that on some deep level, I wasn't alone. There was something universal about what I'd experienced, and Stan held the wisdom I needed to make sense of how it all fit together. About nine months later, I learned that Christina had died and worried that Stan might follow her if there wasn't something to keep him engaged. When I learned about the conference honoring him, I knew I had to go. Welcome to the Bay Area. Um, and as Rick Tarnas has been heard to say, uh, where new ideas meet the least resistance. For over a half century, Stan Groff has fully engaged and then participated in the great transformation of worldview that is taking place in our era. He was my mentor fellow explorer of new visions, co-presenter at many seminars, and guide in experiential therapies. At 75 years ago, Stan and I were kind of conspiring to attack the non-ordinary uh, states of consciousness. When I finally overcame my qualms and moved from semi-hard drugs to psychedelics and uh, started having LSD experiences, which were the most amazing things I had ever had. It was a very different... Here were all these accomplished people, and the one thing they had in common was an experience of non-ordinary states of consciousness. 
I'd always imagined that people who did psychedelics remained hippies for life. And what about the mainstream news warnings of irreparable damage from using LSD? But the presenters were some of the most accomplished and insightful people I'd ever heard. Stan offered them a context that they, in turn, expanded and shared. Stan developed these descriptions, described exactly, I mean, in detail, some of the most gruesome experiences that I had that, you know, where I was like in a medieval torture chamber being beaten to death with, by guys with enormous clubs to a bloody pulp, and like, I thought, well, how does this relate to my Oedipus complex or <laughs> anything else for that matter? For me personally, and many who spoke and many who are in this room, just going near Stan changes your life. During the event, Christina was honored for her contributions as well. She introduced Stan to Muktananda, contributed to the development of holotropic breathwork, and together they created an approach to spiritual emergence when suppressed memories and emotions spontaneously rise to the surface. Their technique helped people avoid hospitalization and misdiagnosis. Christina also shared her struggle with kundalini awakening and alcoholism, which helped others find resolution with their challenges. And I could more than relate to her feelings of insecurity around so many accomplished academics and professionals. The next day was the workshop designed to support the Groff Foundation. I'll never forget how frightened I felt. Here I was, an outsider, among people who knew Stan and had been studying or working with him for years. But I found my courage and suggested that the best way to share Stan's research about the healing power of non-ordinary states of consciousness was to make a movie about him. This is my favorite uh, sculpture here, did you see that? So it have you see like the helicopter, you have a flight, and then you have a ship, and then wheels at the, at the bottom. So it's a protection against any kind of transportation that can be involved. As I set up my equipment for the first interview, I couldn't help thinking, who was I to interview Stan? And yet, I felt so open and clear-headed in his presence, as though I had access to information that wasn't available to me on my own. What took me by surprise was Stan's incredible kindness and generosity. Almost immediately, we dove into his past. Stan grew up in Czechoslovakia, just before the outbreak of World War II. His early childhood was relatively peaceful, but the threat of a Nazi occupation became a reality when the German army invaded in 1939. Stan was eight years old when Nazi soldiers invaded Prague and forced Czech citizens to surrender. For six years, Stan was exposed to their sadistic cruelty, including the brutal retaliation after the assassination of SS officer Reinhard Heydrich, Hitler's third in command. Known as the architect of the Holocaust, Heydrich had been sent to Prague to wipe out defiance of German rule. On May 27, 1942, Heydrich was attacked by Czech resistance fighters and died from his injuries a few days later. The Nazi retaliation lasted more than three months. The neighboring villages of Legitza and Lejaki were destroyed. Most of the adult population was murdered, while all but a few children disappeared. Stan was 12 years old at the time and remembers the continuous executions leading up to the death of the resistance fighters who'd killed Heydrich. It was a terrifying period for the entire country. Thankfully, when the war ended in 1945, Czechoslovakia was restored to its pre-war boundaries and enjoyed a peaceful existence. But just three years later, with the support of the Soviet Union, the communists took over. 
two Czech national heroes died under suspicious circumstances, and once again, a shadow spread over Czechoslovakia. Stan was 17 when he was accused of possessing a leaflet encouraging people to challenge the Communist Party. After school, it was one o'clock, and uh, there was a bell was ringing, and I opened the door, and there were two men in leather coats and, and just broke in, and they just uh, completely ransacked the, the apartment. Stan was arrested and held in prison for four months. In fact, his first experiences with non-ordinary states of consciousness happened during a two-week period of disrupted sleep and interrogations. And basically we had to go through our biography, the whole life from, from childhood. And then we were sent back to the cell and we didn't know if they would come back in another 20 minutes or if we'll be able to sleep the rest of the night. As I was talking about the, the childhood, I started actually seeing the, the scenes from my childhood. Uh, what was really interesting was, in spite of the very, very difficult situation, I started uh, realizing that there was something about it that I enjoyed. It's something of a miracle that he ever made it into medical school after that. But a two-month stint on a student brigade was the first in a series of events that turned it around. Basically, our task was to remove the rock from one side to another so that there was a space for a highway. And uh, they really didn't have any other way of finding out how we worked than by giving them the count of the wheelbarrows that we sort of uh, transferred. So there was a possibility of cheating. Fellow classmates who had joined the Communist Party, despite their lack of commitment to party beliefs, tried to protect Stan by giving him an award for his outstanding work and exceptional relationship with the working class. Stan was later assigned to a school filled with students from laborer and farm worker families. As the school's director was recovering from a heart attack when Stan was admitted, he failed to read Stan's file and recommended him for a presidential gold medal for his exceptional studies. So when the medical school's admission staff read Stan's file, they saw that he'd been acquitted for lack of evidence, but that he'd also been honored as an outstanding laborer and awarded a gold medal by President Gottwald. And so Stan was admitted to medical school. Well, when I was a student working in psychiatry, that was in the psychiatric clinic in Prague. There was a lot of uh, very drastic uh, therapeutic methods that were being used. And when I graduated, uh, I was working in a psychiatric hospital. And as a, as a newcomer, as a sort of freshly baked psychiatrist, I had to get up early and give the electroshocks and the insulin coma up to like uh, 25 electroshocks and 15 uh, insulin comas. From the late 1920s to the 1950s, insulin comas were used to treat schizophrenia. After an insulin injection, patients might perspire heavily. Many salivated profusely. And eventually, they would contort in spasms. Once a profound state of unconsciousness was reached, a nasogastric tube was inserted bile was drawn to verify the correct placement of the tube, and then a glucose solution was administered. Archival films depict patients waking to feel energetic and hungry. The procedure had a mortality rate of one in a hundred. Stan induced 15 insulin comas a day. Electroshock therapy began in the late 1930s from the belief that artificially induced convulsions could cure mental illness. Electrodes were placed on a patient's temples while an electric current passed through them. The resulting convulsions were strong enough to cause broken bones if the patients weren't restrained. Curare, derived from South American plants, was later used to paralyze motor nerves and lessen the convulsions. Stan administered 25 electroshock convulsions daily. Even psychoanalysis proved disappointing for Stan. I mean, I was in psychoanalysis for seven years. And when in the fourth year, I started bringing in my dreams images that were related to the oral period, this was considered to be, to be, you know, relatively successful psychoanalysis. Fortunately for Stan, 
Sandoz Laboratories needed help exploring applications for a new drug synthesized by Albert Hoffman, lysergic acid diethylamide, or LSD. The Swiss scientist was revisiting his synthesis of the ergot fungus when he accidentally intoxicated himself. A drop of the clear solution touched his finger and was absorbed into his system when he wiped his eye. Intrigued by the unusual sensations, Hoffman decided to try a tiny dose a few days later. What followed was an endless bike ride home and a call for a doctor when Hoffman thought he might be dying. Once the crisis passed, Hoffman realized that his discovery was an incredibly powerful psychotropic substance. And uh, 1954, we uh, got a sample of ampules of LSD. They got an idea that it might be something interesting for psychiatrists, psychologists, and would we want to work with it? So my preceptor did not have the time to spend six to eight hours with people on uh, LSD. And so he used several of us as uh, gophers. We, we were sitting there and, you know, taking care of the, uh, the experimental subjects and, and keeping records. But in, in that early stage, students were excluded. So I had two years when I was listening to these incredible stories and not being able to have the experience. So just about the first thing I did, and I graduated, uh, you know, was to have this experience myself. My teacher was specifically interested in entraining the brain waves, which means exposing people to powerful stroboscopic light of various frequencies and finding out if you can influence the brain waves in the suboccipital area. So all of those of us who wanted to have a session, we had to agree that we also would be going through this experiment. When my own experience was culminating, a research assistant took me to a very little room and then she brought this gigantic strobe and in the next moment there was light like I had never seen in my life. My consciousness was catapulted out of my body. I lost the research assistant, I lost the clinic, I lost Prague, I lost the planet. And then I have the feeling that I was completely uh, extinguished. I ceased to exist in uh, the form in which I knew myself. And instead, I had the feeling that I somehow became all of existence. I became nothing, but I became nothing. I became everything. I was in the astronomical universe, or I was the universe. And there were things happening for which, at the time, I didn't even have name. But later, I read about the Big Bang and the black holes and white holes. And Wormhole, just an amazing uh, cosmic spectacle. And then she turned it off, my consciousness started shrinking again, I became myself. But there was a problem because I ended up finding the planet, finding the clinic, finding my body, but my consciousness was kind of floating around the body and I couldn't find ways of aligning those two. At that point, it was absolutely clear to me that what they taught me in the university, that consciousness is somehow created by the uh, activity of the neurons in the brain, suddenly it's totally absurd. I mean, it was clear to me that consciousness was a cosmic phenomenon. Could matter, bouncing of atoms or subatomic particles create all that we see, including the beauty of nature, the beauty of the universe, the intelligence that you see in animals, that you see in people, is it really something that can create science and philosophy? And then you see it's absurd. There is a beauty and there is an intelligence which cannot come out of matter. So I came down from the session that if I'm now stuck with psychiatry, this is by far the most interesting thing. I could do studying these non-ordinary states. At a complex of research institutes near Prague, Stan was involved in laboratory testing of LSD and other substances such as psilocybin and mescaline. Forty test subjects, a mix of healthy individuals and psychiatric patients, would undergo hourly blood draws, urine samples, and psychological and neurological testing during their sessions all in the hope of identifying the chemical source of mental illness. 
Well, the initial excitement was that LSD can produce what we called experimental psychosis. We can give it to quote-unquote normal people, we can do all kinds of tests before, during and after, and we get an idea of what's happening biochemically when the psyche is so profoundly influenced. And this was fascinating because we are talking about in microscopic uh, amounts, you know, 100 millions of a gram can change profoundly human consciousness for six to eight hours. If this is the case, mental diseases, it would be aberrations of chemistry. Now, if we could identify this chemical culprit, we could also find some kind of neutralizing agent. And this would have been like test tube solution of schizophrenia and other, other psychosis. This would be like holy grail of, of psychiatry. But during the testing, it became clear that it was impossible to predict the kind of experience subjects would have, regardless of what psychedelic they took. In fact, the same subject could have dramatically different experiences while taking the same substance on different occasions. So this is not uh, the way pharmacology works. You have a pretty good idea what response you would get with antibiotics or whatever substance we are talking about. We are dealing with a catalyst and that the content is not produced by the substances, but that it's released from the deep unconscious realms that current psychiatry and psychology does not know about. Because when it comes, they think it's pathological. They don't see it as something that's germane to the human psyche. And then I started seeing it as a telescope or a microscope. The telescope, we can see galaxies that we cannot normally study. With microscope, you discover an enormous microworld that is here, but we are not aware of it unless we have the, the proper tool. And so then I took it from the laboratory to a clinical practice and uh, started seeing it as something that's going to deepen and intensify psychotherapy. During this period, Stan won a competition with a paper he wrote about his realizations. The prize earned him the directorship of the psychedelic program at a newly built research center. Just as in the laboratory testing, subjects in the clinical tests had a broad range of experiences, including blissful and ecstatic ones. And even emotionally challenging experiences were soothed as the session ended and memories that had surfaced were resolved. Stan even noted that the clinical session seemed very similar to classic psychotherapy, but over time, patterns emerged. The contents in the unconscious were not stored in the form of kind of disconnected mosaic, but they were forming certain dynamic constellations. Certain issues were appearing on different levels at different times of, the, of their biography, and they were creating these dynamic packets that were connected with the same type of emotions or a physical feeling. Let's say they would have a choking constellation. They would be near drowning when they were seven, then being choked by an older brother repeatedly when they were four, then whooping cough. But then the deeper level was the choking at birth. So I started talking about these constellations as coex systems. In addition to the understanding of coex systems, Stan observed how the experiences of his clients evolved dramatically during a series of sessions. Only the early sessions seemed to have the nature of the experiences that I knew from psychoanalysis. But then sooner or later, even if we are using sort of just medium dosages, people started talking about being in a place where they felt their life was threatened, that they're going crazy, they will never get out of that state. They started having experiences of choking or uh, nausea. And then one after another told me that they believe that what they are experiencing must be a reliving of birth. At a certain point, I decided to test this. And uh, I took 300 micrograms uh, on my own at home. Within an hour, I was in a very, very difficult place. On the wall I had paintings which I painted and there was one which was like a stylized dog with a soldier. They started fighting and then I had the feeling that everything was kind of closing in. And very quickly I was in something that I now call the, the second perinatal matrix. It was like a space where it seemed just absolutely hopeless, uh, very, very uncomfortable uh, emotionally. 
and uh, then I started feeling a pressure on my head. I realized that I was somehow stuck in the birth canal and all my life appeared to be absolutely meaningless. I started seeing the deep truth in existential philosophy, you know, life is absurd. We go from nowhere to nowhere. We start life as infants in pain and this is how we are going to end. Then even if I knew that this was birth, then somehow the thought came that this state would not end unless I find meaning in life. And then I said, well, it's knowledge. And I saw myself going to libraries, devouring one, one book after another. And then it took me to the end of my life when I couldn't remember what I had for dinner, let alone what I read in all those books. And then I said, well, having children gives meaning to your life. And then it was like, well, you don't give meaning to your life by creating creatures whose life is as meaningless as yours. And then after some time, it just sort of very rapidly opened up and suddenly I was in a very ecstatic state. And I realized you cannot find meaning in life using your reason. This was a very important first experience that suddenly showed me whole new potentials of, of uh, psychedelics. Through his own experiences and those of his patients, Stan learned that lower doses brought up biographical information while higher ones brought patients much farther. He also noted that something fascinating was happening. When I was hitting some difficult places, I had a parade of my patients, and I suddenly understood where they were, including the meaninglessness and even suicidal impulses. Equipped with current psychiatry, I just had no clue. The only way was, was experiential learning. You cannot learn that from books what, what these, uh, these patients are going through. Without the distraction of constant testing and with higher doses of LSD, Stan's clients were encouraged to go inward. To Stan's surprise, they kept journeying back to the perinatal realm. It's not easy to really question you know, some of the really fundamental assumptions. And I had a very personal experience that made it even worse. I went as a second year student to a lecture of Professor William Laufberger and I asked how far back does our memory go? Can we, for example, relive our birth? And he looked at me like I was a total asshole and uh, I say, of course not. I mean, uh, the, the cortex is not mildly nice. And then everybody was laughing, uh, so I was pretty shamed. Uh, so, so I had that kind of an ad additional memory, like this was really stupid to think that, uh, that you could relive your birth, even if it seems very convincing. But then, of course, if I saw it again and again, and I had a few more experiences myself, I realized that this, this edifice of, uh, uh, of psychiatry, you know, that looks so respectable, it's like a colossus on clay feet. As Stan described the scientific establishment's reluctance to accept perinatal memories, I remembered my 30 hours of labor giving birth to my daughter, Charlotte. I eventually needed help pushing her out Maybe that's why she wouldn't go through those tunnels at the playgroup. I was so concerned that I took her to see an osteopath. The doctor swore that she wasn't applying any pressure to Charlotte's head. Afterwards, Charlotte had no problem going through the tunnels. When Charlotte was 20 months old, we were attacked by two gunmen. We were living in the suburbs outside of Paris, and I was four months pregnant with my son, Oscar. The first shot missed my head by about 12 inches, and the remaining three shattered our bedroom windows. We escaped unharmed, but for a month or so, I'd wake up at night, reliving the experience and imagining where I would hide. Later, when Oscar was old enough to play hide-and-seek, no one could find him. It was clear to me now that my children's behavior Oscar. had been influenced either by what had happened while they were in the womb or during their actual birth. How 
could scientists so easily dismiss the reality of perinatal memories? The usual view about the mind is that the mind's confined to the head. It's um, nothing but the activity of the brain. For the materialists who represent the majority position within academic life and in science, minds are what brains do and memories are stored materially inside the brain. It's all inside the brain. I think that's an incredibly truncated and narrow view. First of all, I think we access our memories by morphic resonance. They're not inside the brain. And secondly, I think that our consciousness, our minds, are not confined to the inside of our heads, but stretch out beyond them through fields. We're all used to the idea of magnetic fields being inside magnets and stretching beyond them, or the gravitational field of the Earth being inside the Earth and stretching out into space invisibly, or the fields of cell phones being inside the cell phone and stretching invisibly around it, which is why they work. All matter now has fields associated with it. And of course the brain does, it has electromagnetic fields you can measure with an electroencephalograph. But I think that the fields of the mind are much more extensive. And these extended fields of the mind are a kind of morphic field. So it's really a field theory of the mind. Now that I realized that we could hold memories from our time in the womb, I couldn't stop thinking about the influence these unconscious memories might have on our lives. One of Stan's clients showed just how powerful these memories are. Uh, you know, the patient whom I call Peter came with a kind of a combination of uh, obsession and masochistic impulses and tremendous uh, need and wish to be locked in a cellar and be exposed to some emotional and, uh, and physical pains, tortures. Peter would search for these men in parks, train stations, and other public places. And on one occasion, he was struck on the head and robbed. The last episode occurred when Peter was on a train with a man who claimed to have the perfect cellar to satisfy his obsession. When the man got up to use the toilet, Peter gave in to his gnawing doubt and opened the man's bag. Horrified by what he found, Peter jumped from the moving train and ended up in the hospital. When psychiatric treatment failed to help him, he was sent to Stan, where he underwent a series of high-dose LSD sessions. There's a very, very interesting coex system emerged in a series of sessions. The most superficial layers were actually the traumas that he himself created. Then as we continued, another layer of the coex system emerged, which uh, was from the Second World War, when he was taken to Nazi Germany and used in a situation where there was a great danger of bombardment. Two of the SS officers uh, were using him for their homosexual practices, initially under gunpoint. Uh, and then it went to his childhood when his father was alcoholic, was very, very brutal, and used to beat him with a leather strap. And his mother, who actually always wore black, punished him repeatedly by locking him in a dark cellar and leaving him without food. So on that level, it seemed like it was a combined punishment from the two parents that he was seeking. Finally, it ended up in a situation where he was stuck in the birth canal and realized that was the template of the situation that he was searching for. But when he actually experienced that, he got more than he bargained for. Because Stan had previously experienced the kind of death rebirth process Peter underwent, he was not fearful for Peter's safety and could allow the full process to unfold. After that session, Peter was finally liberated from his self-destructive impulses and able to live a productive life. Around the time Stan was working with Peter, he traveled to Amsterdam for a conference on LSD psychotherapy. Pauline McCrick and Joyce Martin were two psychoanalysts who were actually using uh, LSD and doing what they called fusion therapy. Clients who were deprived in their childhood of being held would lie with full body contact and they had amazing results with this. We were both in Amsterdam and so we decided to, to have a session. 
As part of my last perinatal session, I went into this atmosphere of bloody revolutions and in the middle of it I, I really identified with Lenin and shared his passion against oppression. And I realized that part of it was a czar, but a good part of it was the compression of the birth canal. So this kind of atmosphere of revolutions and, and struggling for birth somehow completely fused. And I realized that there's a relationship between historical events like wars and revolutions and the, what we carry in the, the, the perinatal level, possibly even uh, something that is a source of that kind of violence. But then the session ended and I went through the whole range of relationships with women, the destructive feminine that comes in birth, the adventure, the exciting, like a sexual partner. And then I had a feeling of being an infant on her body. The transition from the third matrix into the fourth was like emerging sort of in fire. There was like a goddess with dark complexion and a peak of paradise or heaven. So it was a very, very blissful experience. But she became like a great mother for me. Stan's session with Pauline in Amsterdam revealed the archetypal nature of the birth experience, during which the fetus is exposed to a collective dimension filled with powerful imagery and emotion. But a newborn lacks the capacity to make sense of what is witnessed. And so these impressions remain in the unconscious, influencing us in ways that we don't realize. One of the great contributions of Stan's work is that he uncovered the deep structure, the archetypal pattern, you might say, of the life process as it is incarnated and reincarnated in us as individuals. When Stan discovered the work of Lloyd de Maas and the field of psychohistory, he noted the parallels between the imagery used to goad people to war and experiences that he and his patients had during their sessions. It became clear to Stan that these unconscious memories of helplessness from the second matrix and anger from the third were driving factors in the need for power. This need for control was clearly evident in the book A Sexual Profile of Men in Power, which detailed a seven-year study of call girls and madams whose primary clients were politicians and government officials. The study found that over 50% of those men regularly hired prostitutes, and more than half of them demanded kinky or sadomasochistic sex as a means of coping with the powerlessness that they experienced in government. Nine months in a total dependence on the maternal organism, then there is this incredible roller coaster of birth that we are taking through, and then emerging the total dependence on the, the mother. It leaves a very deep fear of the feminine in the male psyche and frequently clumsy effort to compensate for it, not giving women the same rights, not to treat them as equal citizens and so on. Women go through that also, but because of their physiological function, because of their anatomy, they are able to participate directly in the process of creation. The male participation is very marginal. It can take you know, a few, few minutes and then it's over. The way to resolve traumatic unconscious memory would be if that material fully emerges into, into consciousness, which would be therapeutic. What can happen in everyday life, it comes close to the surface, but uh, that person does not realize what it is exactly, but they feel the need to, to create a situation that would involve those elements. So, for example, the transition from the third to the fourth matrix frequently is experienced as fire. I worked with some people who were arsonists and uh, they had this impulse. They felt that something fantastic would happen if they could experience a big fire. When that happens, they watched it and feel excitement for a while, but that there is a real letdown. They expected something much more phenomenal, but the drive can be strong enough to drive them to do it again and again. In a very similar way, the third matrix involves a lot of sadomasochistic kind of experiences where you feel sexual arousal and you feel confined and you feel sort of choked and so on. It's a kind of unrecognized healing impulse. But for it to be therapeutic, it would have to involve introspection, understanding what you are dealing with and really be fully consciously in touch with that material. Yeah. 
Nothing the conscious mind can think up will ever satisfy the unconscious. It has to originate from the unconscious to be cleared. After hearing so many of Stan's stories, it was time for me to find out what shadows were lurking in my unconscious. Would they be as dark as what Stan had seen? And if so, would I have the courage to confront them? Rule number one, never do this alone. The sitter is there to keep you safe, ground you, and more importantly, to hold the space so that you can completely open to whatever comes. As the LSD took effect, there was a flood of geometric imagery. Some people call it retinal discharge, but now I think I was seeing fractals or even the dimension that holds the blueprints of the physical world. Soon it transitioned into Christina, and then, as though I was seeing through Christina's eyes, it was Stan. There was a sadness as she realized that she was leaving him. But then Stan transitioned into my father, and Christina dissolved into me. The pain was so intense that I knew it couldn't just be mine. I actually felt as though I was choking. In that moment, I understood that although I might have been triggered by the pending death of my father, I was also tapping into the collective sadness. And what a depth of it there was. Addiction, drugs, alcohol, sex, compulsive behavior, anything to dissolve back into the formless ocean of love and avoid this unbearable sadness of separation. It took me two days to feel whole again. If it hadn't been for my kids to think about or the sitter to talk to, I don't know if I would have come out of it. But because I had grieved my dad's death before he died, I was able to listen to his daydreams during those last weeks of his life. And when he finally slipped into a coma, I knew how to help him detach from his body so he wasn't afraid or in pain. He lay like that for 28 hours, and then an hour before my daughter's last ballet performance, he died. I was filming while Charlotte danced when suddenly I remembered that he had sat in that theater and I remembered exactly where he had sat. The memory was so clear that I realized that I was seeing through his eyes. His spirit was there in the theater to watch his granddaughter dance. After the performance, I went to help my mom. When I had finally cleaned the space so that she could remember him in better health, I went home. A few hours later, I let the tears well up and felt myself once again pulled out by my heart. But because I knew that I could survive it, I allowed the sadness to flow, and it felt amazing. If I hadn't witnessed Stan's courage and trusted his example, I doubt any of that would have happened. He wasn't afraid to confront the darkness. In 1967, Stan was invited to continue his research at Johns Hopkins University in Maryland, but pushback against psychedelics was growing, inflamed by flawed studies engineered to generate fear. We have children that are born without legs or arms, the kind of thing we've seen after thalidomid exposure. Even though the studies were eventually dismissed, the culture was reeling from the impact of psychedelics. As a result, the research program at Johns Hopkins University was terminated. Fortunately for Stan, the program at Spring Grove Psychiatric Hospital was still operational. While there, he continued his research, encountering even more intriguing patients. This was a patient who had some of the most difficult pathology, if you want to call it that way, that I've ever seen. 
She was four years in prison, and while on parole, she became a multiple drug addict. Uh, she had very difficult episodes of depression, so it was a kind of a life decision, and so we decided to take our chances. So she had two very powerful sessions. She was from a family where there was alcoholism, there was abuse, there was uh, incest. And then in the third session, suddenly she started crying, she started screaming, and then a vicious expression in her eyes, incredible, incredibly sort of evil expression. And this very deep voice came and introduced uh, itself, himself, as the, the devil. And then came this barrage of insults and threats. There was information that the patient, as such, could not have known. I had a wonderful nurse that was Southern Baptist, and she was shaking. I thought she was getting a heart attack, so I was watching the patient and the nurse. At one point, uh, I said, well, this is obviously the Jungian archetype that's manifesting here, but maybe for that kind of archetype, the crucifix would be the best remedy. Uh, as I was re reacting emotionally, it was just becoming more real. So I started meditating on light. I knew that, you know, from my spiritual reading, that these, these creatures don't like light. Suddenly, it stopped the way it's, uh, it started, sort of, Everything relaxed. And then as she was coming down, we sort of started talking about it. And I realized she remembered only what happened before this episode and what happened after. There's just total amnesia for this. And you know, I wondered if I should sort of bring that up and, and talk about it and they decided just not to do it at all. But she herself felt wonderful. And then very shortly afterwards, she left the hospital and probably with a little lying on the uh, questionnaire, she got a, a job as a taxi driver. But despite the tremendous success of his work, the program lost funding. We were finding it more and more difficult to continue the research, and I had a lot of material, so I really wanted a sabbatical and uh, do some writing, and uh, I got uh, invitations from several publishers, so I could take a year off, and I went to a party in New York City, and there was Michael Murphy there, and he, the co-founder of Esalen. When I met Stan, first in 65, he was probably the best-looking man in the human potential movement. I mean, he was as good-looking as, as Richard Burton. He said, so Stan, what are you doing these days? I said, well, I'm actually taking a year off to write a book. And he said, why don't you come to Esalen? It was my instinct as a, as a director and producer of this ongoing theater at Esalen. He was perfect. And of course, we had been right in the middle of a lot of experimentation with psychedelics. And although psychedelics were not my ally, Stan represented not only another doorway into this, but also sobriety. I mean, he actually thought about it. Tim pretended to think about it, but he just proclaimed a vision of um, taking LSD every Sunday. If it's good, just have more of it. And we saw disaster after disaster during the 60s. So uh, Bob Schwartz gave us some money and Esselin provided a, a beautiful house and off we went. And he became the leading force in our overall programming for most of the years he was there. Besides our breathwork workshops, we offered then months-long workshops. People were coming to Esalen from all over the world, and they didn't want to take just one workshop. So this gave me a chance to choose a topic I was interested in and see who in the world was doing some cutting edge research and invite those people and then uh, always finding like 36 people who would want to do it with us. One popular program combined Vipassana with breathwork. I think of a time when we were holding our large holotropic breathwork and Buddhist practice retreats and there's a room full of some hundreds of people doing the breath work after we had meditated, going through these profound openings with this music playing. Some people are in heavenly states and some people feel like they're dying and getting reborn and some people have past life experiences are turning into birds or animals and some people are having the reliving of their childhood. Every possible thing, it's like being in Dante's Inferno and Purgatorio and Paradiso all at the same time. 
And it's really quite marvelous because it's so well held and tended by the facilitators. And then when things get really dicey, they call Stan over. So I remember one who was a multiple personality who had different altars that would show themselves at different points. And one of them was really demonic. And this whole demonic side started to come out. Like, if you come near me, I will slash and kill you. So the facilitators were a little bit nervous because the voice and the aggression of this demon, you try to fix or help me and I will get you and I will kill you and slash you. It was not an easy person to be tending. So they called Stan over because it seemed like this demon wanted to eat everybody. And Stan came over very calm and cool and sat down and said, tell me more. You know, you're a demon. You have some powers. What are those powers you have? And who do you think you really are as a demon? I mean, do you really know what your identity is? He didn't quite ask it in that way, but he began to like look directly at the demon and say, you don't know really where you come from, do you, who you are? I'm, I'm very pleased to meet you, but you don't. And the demon started to get confused and, and start to look around. And it was like, instead of being afraid of the demon, Stan met this demonic energy with a kind of curiosity and interest and fearlessness that the demon had never met before. And it started to kind of lose its way and then the whole thing morphed. Magic happened when other people were frightened. That kind of innocence that Stan has. It's like this giant kid wandering around saying, wow, look at that. He has this tremendous appreciation for everything. In 1974, Stan was about 43 years old, and I was about 24, working at Esalen as a night guard and then writing my dissertation, you know, during the day. And we got a call at about 4, 4.30 in the morning. The night guard who was on that night said, we've got a crisis and um, we need you guys here right away. 1 a.m. to 5.30 every morning, we would let in people from outside of Esalen to use the baths. A young man had taken LSD with his girlfriend and started to flip out at some point during the session, became violently paranoid. The girlfriend had escaped from the guy. He had gone up the hill to their van. All we knew was that he's got a knife, he's naked, he's psychotically paranoid and violent. As we're approaching the van, uh, I'm thinking to myself, well, this is great, just because I'm writing a dissertation on LSD psychotherapy. I'm now, you know, in a <laughs> life and death situation. So Stan opens the sliding van door, and the bottle is thrown right by his head. And then he goes in, picks up a blanket, wraps it around the man, and puts him in a bear hug that says, okay, you've taken a very powerful psychoactive drug. I want you to close your eyes and pay attention to what's going on inside you. Within about 15 minutes, the young man was laughing at himself, but at the same time embarrassed for what he had caused. It was a real testament to Stan's personal courage, but it also was a, um, an illustration of his whole philosophy of trusting the psyche you know, the very first lecture that I ever heard Stan give in March of 1974 at Esalen, I asked him at the end, uh, what do you do in the case of someone who's in a, a really bad trip where they're descending into an incessant loop that they can't get out of and they feel like they're losing their sanity and these things can have enduring effects, you know, too. And he said with a kind of poetic uh, conciseness that I've never forgotten, he just said, well, the full experience of an emotion is the funeral pyre of the emotion. And he just pointed out that we have a tendency to, of course, wall ourselves off from the pain, the, the scary things in our psyche that are trying to emerge. But he says that's actually the way out of the, the pathology of the suffering. So he was able to convey with that one sentence the idea that bad trips and negative material, which Tim Leary did not prepare the masses for, were actually a, uh, a royal road to uh, transformative healing. 
I think it's essential when we discuss psychedelics now to talk about the challenging experiences and that it's not all easy. MAPS does psychedelic harm reduction at Burning Man and at festivals all over the world. And one of our main principles is difficult is not the same as bad. And I think that's where with psychedelic therapy right now, we prepare people in a much different way and really talk about a lot of the kernels of wisdom will come wrapped in these very difficult experiences. Stan recognized early on that existing schools of psychology couldn't explain the profound experiences and resulting transformations that he and his patients underwent. Even before moving to Esalen, Stan worked with Abe Maslow and Tony Sudich to develop transpersonal psychology, which recognized the spiritual nature of humanity and the importance of memories from our time in the womb and beyond. We got to the point where we were very satisfied with the kind of new psychology, but we had no idea how we could possibly link that gap between, uh, between this kind of system that we created and what we knew as the scientific psychology. And that's where meeting Fritjof Capra and, and reading his book, The Tao of Physics, was extremely important for me. Francis Vaughan invited him to Tiburon to meet transpersonal psychologists, and we really hit it off. We planned these seminars together, which we called Journeys Beyond Space and Time. And those were an inner journey of uh, transpersonal experiences and the outer journey of you know, physicists delving into matter at the atomic and subatomic level. Fritjof would take the morning and tell people you know, how scientists, uh, physicists now see uh, the world of matter. I presented perception of reality where the solid objects of our everyday experience dissolve into energy patterns and where particles can travel backward and forward in time, where these energy patterns furthermore are intrinsically dynamic, the whole universe being some sort of a, a cosmic dance of energy. Stan was describing very similar experiences and as I did, he was comparing them to the experience of mystics. Now we had three perspectives, the mystical experience, the transpersonal experience and the experience of physicists in those subatomic experiments. After lunch, when people came and it was time for me to talk about uh, my research, it was pretty sober as compared to what Fritjof was describing. And I was talking about something that happens in some unusual states of consciousness, whereas Fritjof was redefining the material world that we live in. One of the key insights from the new physics is that reality has something of a holographic structure or a fractal structure. And the simplest example of this is a mathematical structure that we call the Mandelbrot set. Now in science, this is called nested sets of self-similar structures. But I like to think that this is actually a modern scientific discovery of an ancient hermetic principle of alchemy, as above, so below, as within, so without. That basically the microcosm replicates the macrocosm. If we apply these ideas to spirituality, what I would propose is that consciousness itself has this same fractal structure which means that there is a self-similarity at all levels of existence. Stan was one of the very first to give this new conception of life and this new perception of reality an emotional content, an experiential content. I think uh, this is one of his many great contributions. So many new perspectives were introduced during those workshops and month-long intensives Michael Harner, who Stan had met on his first trip to the United States, presented his work in core shamanic practices. It was 1965, we met in Esalen Bathtub, is that Yes, this was an interesting uh, meeting. Yeah. Oh. We were both stark naked when we, when we first met. Yeah, a good way to start. Yeah. And uh, had nothing to hide. Richard Tarnas, together with Stan, developed archetypal astrology as a means for gaining a deeper understanding of the forces influencing individual and collective psyches. 
we noticed the phenomenology of the perinatal matrices could have been passages from handbooks of astrology. So that was mind-blowing because I had no understanding of astrology when I was doing it. But then we found out something even more amazing that actually people were having in their sessions the encounter with elements of these matrices at the time when they had these uh, planets as some significant transits. So it became uh, you know, something that allowed prediction of what kind of experiences people would have. I had the chance to spend very informal time with people who were like the, the pioneers. You know, Fritjof Capra, Rupert Sheldrake, Carl Pribram, we had Houston Smith, Joseph Campbell. You know, university had that kind of a staff. So when I started the International Transpersonal Association, I could pick up the telephone and say, I want to do a conference in, in Bombay, in India. I can pay the round trip ticket and, and feed you, they put, put you up, but I can't give any honorarium. Do you want to come? And they all said yes. Stan Groff wrote me a long handwritten letter saying how much he liked my book. He'd had a copy shipped. And he invited me to speak at a conference he was organizing in Bombay. But I'd never been to California. I'd never heard of things like the New Age movement. I'd never heard of Stan Groff. I'd never heard of Esalen. And suddenly in this hotel was a, a kind of astonishing world of people who were into consciousness research, talking about the Esalen Institute. Stan was talking about his psychotropic breathing, and LSD research, and, and so on. I was amazed to find myself in an environment where I could talk about the things I was really most interested in, where people were interested in finding out more, a kind of fizz of excitement and discovery and new horizons. People were just very hungry to find an atmosphere where they could connect with like-minded people. They were not afraid of criticism that would have any implications you know, for their reputation or their, their position. So we really got the, got the truth from people. That there is a domain of potentiality which is non-local and therefore it is oneness. The universe doesn't work on the Stan represents what has been sorely lacking, which is the long through line, a work over decades. Because in this wild, meandering exploration of the further reaches of human nature, particularly in the 60s, but even in the long sobering up of the 70s, he's been able to provide a huge body of empirical lore. It's I, fair to say, I think, that I wouldn't be doing the research that I'm doing had it not have been for reading Stan's Realms of the Human Unconscious. Yet despite the tremendous insights shared during Stan's tenure at Esalen and his continued exploration of the healing power of non-ordinary states of consciousness, so little has changed. And the work with holotropic states also provides a very, very interesting insight into uh, how we should approach the uh, situation that we have in the world, where we are in global crisis, in some sense on the verge of possible extinction, and not just our species, but taking a few species with us. You know, changing the situation is not simple. We cannot just uh, do uh, kind of transpersonal spiritual sanitization of creation. We simply eliminate everything that we don't like, that we think is, is bad or or evil. It was hard for me to hear what Stan was saying. I'd always hoped that one could avoid darkness and pain. I didn't want to believe that light and shadow were equal parts of the whole. Perhaps ayahuasca could help me make peace with that. The problem with ayahuasca is that it can take a long time to come on. The mistake that I made was thinking I hadn't had enough. I really thought I was dying. But in my heart, I knew that it was too late. There was nothing to be done. So I purged and surrendered. It took me a while to realize that I was in another dimension and that as long as I remained formless in it, I was fine. If I tried to feel my body, I was instantly nauseous. For six hours, I stayed in the quantum field. At times, it seemed I was watching reincarnation, 
where a soul would merge with the possibility wave and then tumble down into increasing density, flipping like a coin between victim and perpetrator. Pretty much every deep experience I've had since has been uncomfortable in ways I never could have imagined. But most often, I end up in a place of great beauty and love, as though the ugliness had to be fully experienced before I had access to the underlying joy. When I look back at my archetypal astrology, I see now that I've been through a series of deaths and rebirths. What died was my limited sense of self. Once that illusion slipped away, I could feel my true nature as energy, beyond the creative and destructive cycles of the universe, timeless and vast, within a unity that might be forgotten, but never lost. I think it's healthier to know that the devil is something within our psyches and within our souls as humans rather than some, you know, object uh, out there. I think people who are in touch with the state of the world right now recognize that we're, we're basically all skating on thin ice. There is a profound sense of, of uncertainty and potentially you know, looming danger of a catastrophic proportions. And it takes a lot of courage to face that. We can't simply be sure we can be bringing in some technological fix or rational solution to the situation. Uncertainty itself is a key part of any initiatory transformation. You can't have a pretend near-death experience in order to have an effective transfiguration of, of how you live. You need to really feel everything is at stake and you don't know the outcome. And if we can have the courage to face that and to go through this dark night of the soul in some sense and to bring all our wits and heart and imagination and bravery together to engage this great threshold, I think that's the key to, to our, our, our future. If anybody's paying attention, they're traumatized in some way. And psychedelics can help us deal with those fears and still look positively at what we can do to contribute to make them better. So it's a lot of the astronauts who've looked back at the Earth from space and realized that it's a single organism, that there are no clear country boundaries, that we're all in this together. We're all part of this 14 billion years of evolution have been spiritualized. When people grasp the sense of the whole, that has profound political implications. And it's a lot cheaper to give somebody a psychedelic than shoot them up to the moon. <laughs> the power of psychedelics to profoundly change people is remarkable. The information that was delivered to me in those experiences has pretty much formed the rest of my life since then. The depression was gone, never came back. I became a different person who was able to enjoy life, who learned how to laugh, who was nicer to my children and my grandchildren. The substance, which was a psychedelic, helped me so much that I dedicated the rest of my life to make it available to everyone who suffers. I now have completely 180 degrees modified my viewpoint to understand that we are spiritual beings um, performing and acting and learning in physical bodies. And it is through the power of some of the psychedelics and through some of the ideas of Stan and the people that he has brought together with him that this new opening has happened in my life as well as in the lives of thousands and millions of people. And now everything's that anytime when things like this happen, of course they happen again and again, I remember what Stan told me. You're ready. Face it. Your psyche will not give you any task that you cannot tackle. Regardless of the method, it's the state one finds themselves in that matters, awake and joyful in the heartfelt knowledge of being part of something greater. It's only fitting that Stan experienced his own rebirth after Christina's passing. For years, he had suffered from debilitating back pain 
and nerve sensitivity in his legs, but a higher than normal dose of medical marijuana launched a process that freed him from that pain. And I had the feeling that uh, I was dying, and uh, I saw all the people who died before me, Angie Ari and uh, Christina, Sasha Shalgin, and Hans Rudi Giger. So I had the feeling this is like end of an era, and I was joining. And then there was that sense like, no, you're not ready yet, and, and sort of you go back, you know, you have more work to do. And I went for about a month into a lot of non-ordinary states of consciousness. Spontaneous chanting was coming. A significant part of it was about whales. During this period, Brigitta, one of Stan's first students and dearly loved by him, reached out. During the first uh, phone call where we uh, reconnected, she told me that she was about to go for a trip where uh, it's possible to actually meet the whales and, and swim with the dolphins. That was an amazing uh, experience. We first met when Brigitte came to a lecture of mine in Freiburg after she had had a very difficult uh, LSD experience. And very shortly afterwards, she participated in our first uh, breathwork and decided to come to Esalen, where she stayed for a year. And she did several of the trainings of holotropic breathwork. So. I've always loved her. She has brought incredible spirits into all the groups uh, that she participated in. And uh, she was always a uh, light of my life. But at a time when, you know, I was committed, we did not have any way of sort of bringing the relationship farther. And then uh, the situation changed. So we decided to join our lives together. And, to it's never too late. No. In, your, in everyone's life, it is just never too late. I never expected that late years in my life would be the, the happiest uh, time of my life. I've just always loved him, and I feel very blessed that we can be together. It's a dream come true. It's just this oneness that we share, and the humor, and the way we see things, the inner journeys that we share. It's just, just wonderful to be married to Stan. And just as Stan and Brigitte's paths circled back to Esalen, where they now teach together, so has my journey returned me to a familiar sense of peace. What began as a quest to reconnect with my teachers has evolved into a deeper understanding of what it is to be human. I followed the path that Stan forged and explored the darkness and the light, finding beauty in both. This is fire. This the tantric imagery that drew me to Stan now makes up a daily practice that not just maintains, but grows the sense of connection I found through my psychedelic work. What I find amazing is the parallel between what happens to one's brain on psychedelics and what is experienced in Tantric meditation. I learned so much from Stan. The techniques he developed and the spiritual grounding he provided for them hold such promise for these challenging times. May we follow his example and begin our own journeys of discovery. One really fundamental principle of shamanism is that everything is one and is alive and has spirit. It, it was indeed this other reality that could be accessed in different ways. And like Stan, I've come to that conclusion uh, that is ontologically real. The energies that people liberate in themselves is, is just so beautiful to see. I mean, we, we just live up to, I don't know, how little of our potential in normal, normal everyday life. And so seeing people becoming alive, including myself, uh, and uh, awakening is just beautiful. Bringing about any change in, in our way of being in the world is having some access to these deep layers. And uh, one of the 
ways used by all traditions is sound. Those moments that may be so tragic or so joyful, so ecstatic, that reside in the collective, maybe reside in the collective unconscious, they live again through us in these non-ordinary states. And again, the practice of working with the transits, of understanding them through an astrological lens, can provide a map to see each one of those experiences through history and then how it comes to bear on our own personal experience. A new concept, a new paradigm from the ground up. What the universe is, who we are, and where we are going. These are to me very the key questions and they have basically, it has to be an integral, integrative answer. Or if you don't find it, then it's our fault because the universe doesn't work on little bits and pieces. It works as a whole. It's not like a side effect of these drugs, you see. Uh, like you say, well, they have these religious experiences. Uh, because then you're, uh, the spiritual dimension is, is the core dimension. Yeah. It's the core dimension. It's not a, an add-on <laughs> that you can take or leave. Uh, and that, that like, um, changes everything. People who do some responsible systematic work with these uh, powerful experiential methods from, from some intense spiritual practice to, to psychedelics, they tend to develop independently a certain kind of uh, worldview that they share. It's the Buckminster Fuller idea, you know, we are on a spaceship, we are all in it together, and what some of us do will influence the others. There's no way of isolating that. I have seen that powerful transformation happening in individuals. Now, whether this is possible on a large scale and whether we have enough time, that's a, di that's a different uh, story.